some additional gas laws, what we're going to cover in this lesson. And we already covered the ideal gas law and the combined gas law and the laws that we use to kind of derive those and build it up into. Uh, in this one, we're going to go through Dalton's law of partial pressures, Graham's law of effusion, an expression for density, and then talk about STP, standard temperature and pressure. Now, this lesson is part of my high school chemistry playlist. I'll be releasing these lessons weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year. So if you want to be notified every time I post a new lesson or a new playlist, subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification. All right, so we're going to start with Dalton's law of partial pressures here. And uh, here we're going to look at the questions down below. And, and the first question here deals with uh, a rigid container that has 10 moles of N2, 8 moles of O2, and 2 moles of CO2 in it with a total pressure of 50 atmospheres. And what Dalton's law of partial pressures also ultimately says is that this total pressure of 50 atmospheres is really equal to what we call the partial pressure of the nitrogen, the partial pressure of the oxygen, and the partial pressure of the CO2. And so what's a partial pressure? Well, a partial pressure is just really the part of the total pressure that a, a certain gas is responsible for. And it totally is dependent upon how many moles of that gas you have. The size of the gas doesn't matter because recall, most of a gas is made up of empty space. And so the size of the molecules is irrelevant. So all gases kind of contribute to the pressure equally is what we're saying. And the more moles you have, the more of a contribution it's gonna make. So here in this case, the total pressure of 50 atmospheres is really gonna equal again, the of all those partial pressures. So the partial pressure is going to equal the mole fraction of the gas times the total pressure. And so the idea is that, you know, in this case, you can quickly see that like 10 out of a total of 20 moles are nitrogen. Well, if nitrogen represents half the moles of gas, then it's also going to re be responsible for half of the pressure. And that's kind of what we're going to derive with these lovely expressions right here. <clears throat> so in this one, we actually want to come and derive uh, a partial pressure for each one of these. And so if we do this for the nitrogen first, like we said, so the partial pressure of nitrogen is equal to a mole fraction of 10 out of 20. So a mole fraction is just the fraction of the moles or that are whatever the gas you're talking about. In this case, it's 10 out of the total of 20, 10 plus 8 plus 2. And so that mole fraction of 10 20ths times the total pressure of 50 atmospheres. And we can see that the nitrogen is responsible for a partial pressure of 25 atmospheres. And so like we said, if nitrogen represents half the moles in the container, then it's responsible for half of the 50 atmospheres of pressure. We can do the same thing for the O2, and in this case, the partial pressure of the O2 would equal the mole fraction. In this case, it's responsible for 8 out of a total of 20 moles times that total pressure of 50 atmospheres. If you notice 8 out of 20, you could also look at that as reducing down to 4 out of 10, which is 40%. And again, <clears throat> excuse me, if you want to look at this in terms of percentages, uh, if, if O2 represents 40% of the moles of gas, then it's responsible for 40% of the total pressure. which comes out to 20 atmospheres. All right, so then finally the CO2. And the CO2, we could calculate this out the same way, but we don't need to because we know that the individual partial pressures, again, have to add up to a total of 50 atmospheres. Well, if the N2 is 25 and the O2 is 20, well then the remaining that you need to get up to a total of 50 atmospheres is going to be five atmospheres. But in this case, we could have calculated it exactly the same way, though. So PCO2 is equal to the mole fraction of CO2, which in this case is 2 out of 20 times the total pressure of 50 atmospheres. And 2 out of 20 is 10%, and 10% of 50 is indeed 5 atmospheres. This is Dalton's law of partial pressures. All right, the next thing I want to talk about is the volume of one mole of gas under the conditions that we define as STP, which stands for standard temperature and pressure. And that standard temperature here, we'll do this in red, is 273 Kelvin, so zero degrees Celsius. And the standard pressure identified by STP is one atmosphere. And so it turns out under these conditions, the volume of one mole of any, any gas that's behaving ideally is going to be 22.4 liters. And it doesn't matter if that's one mole of N2, one mole of CO2, one mole of argon. And again, the identity of the gas doesn't matter and how large the molecules are don't matter because again, most of any gas behaving ideally is made up of empty space and the molecules themselves have negligible volume. Cool. So, and if you look, we can just derive this from the ideal gas law. So if you recall PV equals nrt and if we rearrange this v equals nrt over p 
Well, if you plug in one for the number of moles of gas and plug in 0.08206 for the gas constant, plug in 273 for the temperature and one atmosphere for the pressure, then one mole of gas at STP comes out to have a volume. You just plug it out and it comes out to 22.4 liters. Cool. So this is a special set of conditions. We love talking about the context of STP quite regularly. And as a result, it's often just convenient to memorize this 22.4 liter number. So obviously it only applies to STP, but it's really common. So <clears throat> place where it might help you is in the next example here. And uh, if you look at that next example, so we're given a chemical reaction and we're going to react magnesium plus hydrochloric acid to produce hydrogen gas. So, and the gas is really the key here. All right, so in this case, we're told that we're starting with 48.6 grams of magnesium. And the question asks, what volume of hydrogen gas is gonna be produced at STP if this 48.6 grams of magnesium is gonna react with excess HCl? Okay, well, in this case, this is going back to your stoichiometry and we can see that it's a mole to mole ratio here. And since HCl is in excess, it makes the magnesium our limiting reactant. And we can see that magnesium to hydrogen is a one to one mole to mole ratio. And so for every mole of magnesium, we're going to get a mole of hydrogen gas. So if we look here, we can first convert the moles of magnesium, I'm sorry, the grams of magnesium to moles through the molar mass. And one mole of magnesium is 24.3 grams right off the periodic table. And in this case, you can see that, oh, if we got 48.6 grams, that's exactly two moles. Well, two moles of magnesium is going to give us two moles of hydrogen based on that one to one ratio. And the way we'd work that out formally is we just multiply by that mole uh, to mole ratio. And so in this case, one mole of magnesium produces one mole of H2 gas. And so from here, we could actually use this to figure out that, oh, we got two moles of H2 gas. And if you got two moles of H2 gas, well, the question is, what volume does it occupy at STP? Well, if you didn't know this lovely number, what you'd end up doing is just plugging it right back in here. You got two moles of hydrogen gas. You know it's at STP, so temperature is 273 Kelvin, pressure is one atmosphere, plug in the gas constant and solve for V. However, if you have memorized this constant, as long as you're at STP, you can avoid doing any kind of complex ideal gas uh, equation calculation and you can treat this as just another conversion factor and you can say that one mole of any gas including hydrogen at STP has a volume of 22.4 liters and like I said it's just a conversion factor converting moles of gas to volume as long as you're at STP. If you're not at STP, well then by all means go back and use the ideal gas law and just stop right here and calculate the number of moles of gas and then plug that in for N. But if you're at STP, this makes it a lot easier and you just treat it like a longer stoichiometry problem here. And so in this case, 48.6 divided by 24.3 is two and two ultimately times 22.4 is gonna get us 44.8 liters. Cool. So it just saves us a little bit on the, on the back end of that calculation, and it keeps us from having to use that ideal gas law. All right, so now we want to take a look at gas density. And uh, you might recall that density is mass per volume, or mass per unit volume, we say. And, uh, and this expression is still true for gas as well, but we'll find out we're going to derive a different expression as well. And uh, the calculation we want to do is what is the density of helium at two atmospheres and 273 Kelvin? And in this case, getting the mass and the volume looks to be a little bit problematic. And so it turns out dance, density, you might recall, is one of those intensive properties. It doesn't matter what size sample you have. And so what I'm going to do is just pick my own sample size because it doesn't matter. And I'm going to pick a convenient sample size. I'm going to pick one mole because I can make this pretty easy here because I really want a mass and a volume. Well, one mole of helium right off the periodic table, that is the mole, you know, the molar mass is for one mole. So the one mole of helium weighs four grams and I got a mass, but now I need to get a volume. Well, again, we're going to get this from the ideal gas law. So recall that your volume equals NRT over P. And in this case, I chose one mole. So one mole 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin times a temperature of 273 and your pressure of two atmospheres. Cool. And plug and chug in your calculator. Find out that one mole of gas at this temperature is going to occupy 11.2 liters. 
Cool, and then we can calculate that density and just say it's equal to four grams over 11.2 liters. And here I'll pull out the calculator. So four divided by 11.2 is 0.357. I'll round that to 0.36. Notice that's in grams per liter. Cool. So that is our density calculation. So however, this would have been a lot easier if we would have known the following lovely equation that we're gonna to get to. So we're gonna derive it though first. So density is mass over volume. So we're gonna look at mass over volume. In fact, we're gonna turn something else into mass over volume. We'll start with PV equals NRT. And what we're gonna do is to N over V. And that means move R and T to the other side. So it'd be P over RT. And so in this case, the closest you can get from the ideal gas law to getting something that looks like mass over volume is getting moles over volume instead. However, you guys know how to convert moles into grams. You just multiply by the molar mass. And so in this case, I'm going to multiply this by the molar mass. And this would now be mass over volume. But these two sides of the equation would no longer be equal. If I multiply the right-hand side of the equation by molar mass, then I've got to multiply this left-hand side by molar mass as well. And all of a sudden, this again now equals mass over volume, and we've now come up with a new expression for the density of a gas. And so in this case, that new expression is pressure times molar mass all over RT. And I don't really need that time symbol, truth be told. So this M, funky little M right here, stands for molar mass in this case. <clears throat> And so now we, we've got another expression for calculating density. Instead of having to figure out the mass and volume of our sample, as long as I know the pressure, the molar mass of my gas, and the temperature, I'm good to go. And so in our case, all we would have had to say is, well, the pressure was two atmospheres. Molar mass is four grams per mole for helium, all over R, point zero eight two zero six liter atmosphere. Let's get that right liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin, and then times our temperature of 273 Kelvin. And if you pull out your lovely calculator here and you do two times four divided by 0.08206 and 273, and you get 0.36 grams liter as we should the exact same answer and so we just now have another way to actually calculate the density of a gas that just might be more convenient in cer certain situations now the truth is so you don't need this equation we we again we did this calculation without actually having to derive this first we just had to figure out the mass and volume and realize that we could pick any sample size because density is an intensive property so however this might have been a little easier based on what we were provided with we knew the molar mass of helium we knew the pressure we knew the temperature this would have been a lot easier route to go had we known that equation from the get-go so the last gas law we're going to talk about here is Graham's law of effusion. And to talk about that, we really got to talk about what first is effusion. So you might be familiar with the word diffusion. And diffusion is where something like a gas, doesn't have to be gas, can happen in solution as well. But a gas travels from areas of high concentration out to areas of low concentration. It diffuses across the room. So for example, if I put a you know, bottle of cologne in the corner there and take off the cap, eventually it will spread throughout the room. And uh, people on the opposite side of the room would be able to smell it, well, especially in a small room like this, but even in larger rooms. Uh, well, effusion does still deal with kind of the movement of gases in this case. So, but it's when a gas travels through a narrow slit or a hole. That is called effusion. And so Graham's law of effusion deals with relative rates of effusion. So say I've got a lovely balloon here filled with equal number of moles of hydrogen and oxygen gases, and I jab it with a needle. Well, if I jab this lovely balloon with a needle, it's going to pop. And that's not going to demonstrate what we want here. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to take this lovely balloon and I'm going to put a piece of tape on one side. So, and then I'm going to very gently poke a hole right where that tape is with that needle. And that tape actually will keep the balloon from popping. So, but once this happens, then all of a sudden the hydrogen and the oxygen gases will start escaping. <clears throat> So, and it turns out whichever one is on average moving faster at a higher velocity is going to escape faster. And Graham's law of effusion tells us how many times faster, if you will. So if you look at hydrogen and oxygen, so assuming they've been in this balloon together 
for a long period of time, they're going to be at the same temperature. And you guys might recall at the beginning of this chapter, we talked about the average kinetic energy being proportional to temperature. And so if these gases are at the same temperature, what that really means is they have the same average kinetic energy, the same energy of motion. So, but don't think that means that they're moving at the same speed on average, because that's not true. If two things have the same energy, it doesn't mean they have to move at the same speed. So think about me doing a race here. And we're gonna have two vehicles with exactly the same engine. I'm gonna build out a Volkswagen with a Volkswagen engine. And then I'm gonna take a semi truck and also put in it a Volkswagen engine, the exact same engine I put in another Volkswagen. So that's the race I'm gonna do. A Volkswagen with a Volkswagen engine against a semi truck with a Volkswagen engine. So they have the same engine, which has the same power output, can produce the same kinetic energy. However, the semi truck's gonna be moving way slower than the Volkswagen with having the same amount of energy. And it's just pushing around less mass. You might have learned in a physics class somewhere along the way, but maybe not. But it turns out kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared. And so it's related both to an object's mass and its velocity. Well, if they have the same kinetic energy, well then the one with the smaller m would have the larger v. That's kind of where that's coming from. And so same thing here, I've got these two lovely gases and again, being at the same temperature, the same average kinetic energy, but whichever one is lighter will on average be moving faster. And that's gonna be the hydrogen gas in this case. And Graham's law of fusion allows us to, with a mathematical calculation, figure it out. And ultimately, if you look at where Graham's law of fusion comes from, it's just taking the one half mv squared of the hydrogen and setting it equal to the one half mv squared of the oxygen. And you can derive it from that. So deriving is not important though. I just want to make sure for those of you that are inclined, that's where it kind of comes from. So, but in this case, we're just going to kind of get these relative rates of refusion. Now we're not actually going to solve for either one of these R values. We're going to solve for it as a ratio. That'll tell us how many times faster. And so in this case, if I want how many times faster is the hydrogen escape? Well, then I'll put rate of hydrogen on the top, rate of oxygen on the bottom, and then we'll have molar mass of oxygen on top, molar mass of hydrogen on the bottom. And this will be what we calculate here. So again, we're not gonna calculate either one of these rates individually, just as relative one to the other. So rate of hydrogen relative to the rate of oxygen equals the square root. And the molar mass of O2 right off the periodic table would be 32 grams per mole. And the molar mass for hydrogen, notice it's H2 again, just like it was O2, so it's not one, it's two grams per mole. And 32 divided by two is 16, and the square root of 16 is four. And what that means is that the hydrogen would be escaping out of the balloon four times faster than the oxygen. And so notice, even though the hydrogen is 16 times lighter than oxygen, it only escapes out of the balloon four times faster. That is Graham's law of effusion. <clears throat> now Graham's law of effusion, you can also apply this to diffusion. Lighter gases just travel faster and will diffuse across a room faster. So say for example, you decide that uh, you wanna go to a party because a certain somebody that you like is going to be at that party and you're trying to get up the nerve. I'm gonna talk to this person when I get there. So, and you know, but you go prepared, you know, you, you gotta smell good when you go there. And so you go to the store and you get some uh, cologne or perfume, but I know you're in high school, so I know you can't afford, you know, anything too expensive. So you get cheap cologne and cheap perfume, which is gonna be made up of mostly of ethanol, which looks like this. And actually we could summarize that as C2H6O. And if we look at the molecular weight of this, oxygen 16, two carbons, two times 12 is 24. So that's 16 plus 24 is 40 plus the six, is 46. So you drench your collar in some of this cheap cologne or cheap perfume, and you go to this party and you're like, I'm gonna talk to him or her, I'm gonna talk to him or her. And you're working yourself up as you go there. And so then you knock on the door and the person you're there to see opens the door and you weren't expecting them to be there. So at least not the one answering the door. You're expecting to talk to them a little later, but you weren't prepared for them to be the one answering the door. And you're like, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah. Oh. And in your nervousness, you just kind of let a little wind go. Well, flatulence, the major component is methane gas, the molecular weight of which is now 16. And so my question for you is, is this person going to smell your cologne or perfume first or your flatulence first? Which one's going to diffuse to their nose faster? Well, unfortunately for you, <laughs> this isn't gonna work out so well for you. Your flatulence, the principal component of which is methane, is lighter and therefore will 
fuse toward their nose faster, and this is not gonna work out well for you. So like I said, we can apply the same principles of effusion here to diffusion as well, even in an absurd example. Now, if you thought this joke was funny, would you consider giving me a like and a share? And if you thought it was obnoxious, would you still consider giving me a like and a share? Truth be told, if you found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? It's a couple of the best things you could do to help support the channel. And if you're looking for the study guide or if you're looking for practice problems for high school chemistry here, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.